the fortunes of the uh, North Staffordshire coalfield reflect the fortunes of the industry in general. Uh, you can look at certain areas of the country like the North East where the coal industry was established and very, very large five and six hundred years ago, but that was largely because they had sea transport. But with the massive increase in industrial demand for both iron and coal, the, the Potteries coal field expanded more or less in uh, parallel with most other coal fields. And during from about the 1850s, it, there was a massive increase. So by the time it came to 1913, uh, the amount of coal produced being produced increased sixfold. The amount of people employed in the industry went increased sixfold. Uh, and the peak year for production in Britain, uh, I'm not sure whether it was the same in North Staffordshire, was 1913. After 1913, of course, there was the First World War, and then there was a uh, very turbulent times right through the 20s and 30s. Of course there was the war in the early 1940s and the industry had got a lot of government controls on it in the Second World War. Uh, they were nationalised immediately after the war when there was very large amounts of money thrown at the in industry. Uh, the bull stand, the new Wolstanton mine was sunk uh, by deepening the shafts. Florence Colliery was had a massive reorganisation on it. Uh, Hemeath had a sunk a second shaft at Hemeath and, and really Hemeath was one of the great uh, hopes of the industry and to a certain degree fulfilled it. To the east of the main Potteries coalfield we have the uh, Cheadle coalfield and Foxfield was the last large mine to work on the Cheadle coalfield. There were a couple of small mines that worked in the 1980s, but uh, Foxfield, and it lasted until the late 60s, uh, was basically quite a bit, bit different to the majority of the potteries uh, collieries. Uh, the mineral resource was very, very large. It had got far more seams than anywhere else in the country, and also it had got a large number of thick seams, and the total thickness of coal worked in the, in the North Staffordshire, totalling 50 metres, which is a very big thickness of coal. Well, the, the geological structure of the coal field, it's uh, generally referred to as the pottery syncline. Uh, a syncline being a basin, uh, with the coal seams outcropping along the sides and going uh, plunging deeply into the centre. Buildings. We've got the pit head baths up opposite the, the other side of the road, which are important. There is only Chatley Whitfield now with any pit head baths, apart from ourselves at Akedale. Uh, and then, of course, the, the fitting shops across the way there, which were taken over by Johnson Walsh, the shop blasters. Fine company, done such a lot of good free work for us at the Heritage Centre, keeping the heritage alive. Good colliery site. Chatley Whitfield was a very big mine, but it was a big mine because the operators had got very favourable mining conditions and they had uh, acquired very large mineral leases which allowed them to uh, establish a very big mine. Uh, in actual fact, uh, Whitfield is very important, it was a very important mine. At one time in the 20s and 30s it was employing approximately 5,000 people of which 4,000 were working underground and that's a lot of people. Uh, at the same time, it was the first mine in Britain to be uh, producing the excess of a million tonnes a year. And, and during the war years, it was producing about uh, one and a quarter million tonnes a year with, again, nearly 4,000 people on the books, which, are, which is a very, very big mine. And that was in a, a totally different league to most of the other mines. You, you arrive at the pit, um, probably half, half an hour or three quarters of an hour before you're due to ride and, and get your dirty clobber on and up to the lamp house, draw your checks, your lamp, 
and have five or six minutes probably standing in the sunshine having a last fag of the smoke or talking about what's gone on the day before or anything like that. Then you make your way to the top of the pit, you get in the cage shoved in, some people say it's like cattle game, shoved in and dropped down the hill and that's it, seven and a quarter hours, away you go, darkness, daylight, sunshine, rain and nothing comes in the same, everything just one black, same atmosphere all the way. Well, you, you're travelling down the shaft and your ears start popping and the wind's blowing up your overalls. Yeah, it's it's not a very nice experience at all going down the shaft. So, some of the you know the speeds in mid shaft are quite fast in some pits. Once you're down <coughs> the pit, you, you're down there for seven and a quarter hours unless you have an accident or get taken ill. Yeah. Well, as a factory worker, if he gets uh, fed up with his work and he decides to leave an hour early, he, he can do so. Yeah. One thing about the mine is when he gets down the pit, he's got nowhere to have his snapping. He has to sit down on the floor. He doesn't have any tea, just water. He's got no, no canteen facilities, no lavatories, nothing. Yeah, the, one of the other very big mines was Victoria, which pe people tend to forget. Uh, it had got a fairly big take, but it was got Whitfield to the south, which so they couldn't expand to the south, and to the all other sides, the, the seams outcropped, so it didn't go beyond. And, and Victoria basically worked until it had exhausted everything that was working. When you've finished the shift, you've just got off the local at pit bottom, you're standing there waiting with all the other men, thinking what you're going to do when you get up the pit. Have a shower straight in the pub, have a pint, or go straight home, sit down, read the paper, it's beautiful, lovely. You're coming up in the cage and you're wondering what's the weather like, because you don't know, for all as you know, it could be throwing it down. The weather's no different down the pit, never any difference. When you come up, you're on days, bog-eyed shift, you come out, you see that sunshine, it's a great feeling when you get back on the bank. Uh, you come out of the cage and you see the other poor buggers just going down and you think, thank God I've done. You know you're going to have a shower, you're going to get freshened up. You've got the afternoon and the, and the evening, the sunset to look forward to, it's fantastic. one of the most important colliers in uh, certainly in Bursley in its day but there were lots of good times there lots of good men I remember myself going down Sneed one day and walking all the way under Bursley to well, Stanton Pit Bottom uh, what fine memory
Well, apart from the major mines, uh, Stoke-on-Trent well, had a lot or, or more, particularly Newcastle Borough, had a, a myriad of small mines which were generally refer, referred to as footrails. Uh, this is supposedly a de derivation of the words foot and rail, meaning that people could walk those rails down it and people could walk into the mines. And these mines, at the time of nationalisation, there was uh, about 40 such mines and even as late as the late 1980s there were still 12 working. Uh, these were super useful purpose. They were working the coal, near surface coal, in, in a lot of cases in the poorer seams that hadn't been worked uh, you know, uh, earlier uh, because previously the quality of coal had been absolutely paramount. Uh, with the advent of big power stations that came less critical on quality where high, high ash coals were very desirable and this opened up the door for a lot of small mines to work and these were basically working small blocks of coal which were either isolated by other workings, geological faults uh, and uh, were too small to be bothered with a uh, to support a large mine. If you have a thousand people working down a mine you need very big areas of coal to keep them busy. If you have a mine employing ten people, by the very nature of it you need a block of coal which is only a hundredth of the size. And 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 in, and in the potteries there was uh, numerous of these very small mines uh, which worked very very successful and provided in latter years they were producing you know, about a quarter of a million tonnes a year which is a very significant uh, tonnage and, and at times employing you know, four or five hundred people so uh, if somebody came into Stoke now and offered to provide somebody who would give us provide 500 jobs everybody would be very pleased so they, they did serve a useful purpose and one of the useful purposes was they were making the best of the resource they were working bits of coal that if they hadn't if a small mine hadn't have worked it they would never have been worked The last large mine to survive was a uh, Silverdale colliery which worked up until Christmas 1997. Uh, the resources there, theoretically vast amounts of coal there, but it was very, very faulted and they just were not getting enough money to be able to uh, basically find new reserves. They couldn't afford to find new reserves and uh, the, 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 yeah, there was just the geological conditions were basically not good enough for them. In the, the Lisi colliery, I worked in the different seams, in the moss, the four foot and the five foot, which was reckoned to be the best coals there was, eating coals anyway, uh, in the country. And then there was the Bullhurst, and uh, at the many, we, I worked in the rearers a bit, and the ten foot. In the rearers at the many pit, uh, you had to go a ladder, I should think about 40 yards, and when he got to the top, there'd be a, a level that had been started in, a drift level, and the man would be working his coal along, so far along, on this level, and keep ready it back, and then it would be ready back so he, he could throw it down the, uh, the chute that was put aside of the, the ladder, do you see? And then when, and they, when they got so far along, too far, they'd start again and start up again, you see, and start putting the ladders up then to form another level off. Started to work in the pit bottom, coupling up the wagons. That was a boy's job in them days. And then when I'd served my apprenticeship, I went into the workings. And I used to assist the dateless or the colliers, 
bringing and fetching things for them. Eventually, at 19, I wanted some extra wages, so I started to load. And at 21, I started as a collier. And then I was in the money. I used to get about three pounds a week. A little fortune in them days. Then I went to work at Aldish Colliery. I worked there for another 21 years before I finished work altogether with that complaint pneumoconiosis. Well, Wolfstanton, together with Holditch, were unusual in the sense that they were both sunk for iron mines. Uh, they'd got very thick uh, ironstones, primarily the black band red mine and red shag seams, which were heavily exploited in the Apedale Valley. Neither of them in pre-nationalisation times were considered to be big collieries and, and certainly with Wolfstanton iron was the uh, one of its major sources and of course it was uh, immediately adjacent to Shelton Bar and at that time there was no D-road so it was really a case that the ironstone could be provided into Shelton Bar without too much of a problem. Okay well Wolfstanton yeah most important colliery in the um, coal field it was the new shafts were sunk in the 60s and at the time it was the deepest shaft in, uh, in um, England. Some of the other mines, uh, things like Chatley Whitfield, uh, Sneed and Deep Pit, they had theoretically got coal to the dip, dip but they were merged with Wolstanton because Wolstanton was supposedly going to be the super pit. It uh, never never achieved what it was it's what it was expected of it. Well Barry Hill, yeah, again another fine pit in its day. I'll tell you a sight, there's one very ill. Oh, we took a heap and we put it into a hole. Marvellous job. In about four days they'd taken a ruddy lot and shoved it in. And uh, it was really marvellous. They got oh, half a dozen or so machines. But they were going down this rubbery place, you know, sticking it over. It fricked me to death when I saw them operating, 45 mile an hour, 50 mile a bloody hour, rolling and rolling and rolling. That's what you can do when you've got a hole there and a heap there. Well, you've got much bigger things than that to do, but that proved that we could do it and do it very well. People may go five, six thousand miles to Egypt to see a pyramid made of sand. It's because, you know, a pyramid goes up. It's a simple triangle going up architecturally. You had a pit dip made by men. It was a simple triangle that went up on the top. It became, for some reason, the simple triangle, an object of uh, dislike, an object, oh, people must get it flat or, or put trees on it. I thought a great, dark, beautiful and grey triangle, sometime with snow on the top, was more beautiful than Kilimanjaro. It was interesting that although uh, we weren't uh, um, in any form of collaboration officially with the council uh, that the work on the tip at Norton um, commenced on the same day as the work on the tip at Sneed and as we arrived on the crest of the tip in our bulldozer having worked up a one in one and a half gradient with it we saw that the bulldozer of the council operations at Sneed had arrived at the top there at the same moment so we felt this was very auspicious. Oh yes the great Sneed bet dip well I don't know the other day I was looking at it and I don't know, I looked at it and I, for some reason or other, noticed and I saw where a triangle used to be, there was a mellow hump. And I thought, that's really a pleasant thing. And for the moment I was sad about the triangle as I remembered it, but only in the act of memory. Soon I thought, there's a mellow hump. That's a thing I'd never seen before. Now there. The Kemble Colliery is underneath the Holiday Inn and it was on the same site as the Stafford Colliery, uh, a bit confusing, uh, both run by the same company and uh, there's five shafts on the site. The two Stafford shafts were very deep and worked the deep coal underneath the Hanford area and uh, Sidaway and all that area and the 
Kemble shafts were much shallower working the, some of the upper seams. They had been working to the south and they were getting to the limit of what they could comfortably ventilate and they realised there was vast uh, resources to the south so they sunk a, a shaft at Hemeath. That became the coal production shaft for the mine and the Kemble was used for ventilation and training purposes afterwards. Lawrence, yeah, fine colliery in its day again. Magnificent, coupled up with Emmeath Underground. Uh, towards the end, they, they did a million ton. I think it was, uh, I don't know, 75 or something. They, they drew a million tons. Emmeath was a very big mine, very, very bold project and a very impressive project. Uh, the, the coal had been known for a long time and the, there'd been a shaft sunk on the Hemeath site, the, the Hemeath number one shaft, uh, in the 1920s. Uh, there was six metre diameter shaft, about just over 2,200 feet deep, something like that. And that had been sunk as a, a southern shaft for the Kemble colliery. On nationalisation, the National Coal Board realised that there was very, very large reserves of coal. And when I say large, they extend, they are continuous as far as the Cannock Chase coal field. So there's a, an area of about 15 miles of unworked coal to the south. And so they sunk a second shaft, a 7.4 diameter shaft, which was in the excess of a thousand metres deep and one of the deepest shafts in the country, the only mine shaft in the country to be deeper is the, was Bull Stanton. And this was a, a great, the Great White Hope. In later years it connected with Bulls, with uh, Florence and I think in its latter years under the British coal it was producing in the excess of two and a half million tonnes a year. So it was a very, very large mine. It's got a very large site. Uh, uh, not only had the two shafts in the 1970s, they also put in a surface drift which is about 1.8 kilometres long and at one in four, so uh, which is more or less the, almost down at Ballston by the time it gets to the bottom of the drift. And it had got a lot of resources, but again it was geologically complex. They, had not, they hadn't got vast areas of coal which they could go out without faulting, so they had to work around faulting. So it was a, an expensive uh, mine to work, but you know, it had possibly got as much coal as any mine in the country when it closed. You know, it had got vast amounts of coal which could be re recovered, but unfortunately uh, you, you had to keep, compete with world prices. When you hear on the, the television and the radio that it's all mechanisation, with the mechanisation we've got in mining today, the miner's task is still a hard one. He's got to work for his pittance, which is what it is for the type of work he does. Well, I think mining is uh, one of the horriblest jobs there is out, but I'd never leave it. It's, I like it. Well, you either like it or you don't like it. Mining's just a way of life, you just get used to it. After a bit, just like any other job. Same as pit life, I think it's amazing really because of the different people that you've got in the pit. Uh, you've got all sorts, you've Geordies, you've Staffies, and you've Poles, you've Ukrainians, you've all the lot, anything you can think of. And they all mix as one happy family. You know, if the world is the same place as the pit, as far as mixing with foreigners and this, that and the other, It'd be a far better bloody place than what it is now.